<laughs> in 19, late 1990. So those kind of multiple investments are still going on with India, but not with Pakistan because of the insecurity. So the violence is a big deterrent, both international conflict and domestic conflict to development and progress in the region. Now even, you can't even play cricket because of the fear of violence. There are also some things very fascinating about this region. Uh, I was in Turkey in the beginning of this month and I met a lot of religious scholars. Uh, some of them could speak in Arabic, but others spoke in Turkish. So the translators would say, I guess the first question they would ask is, he doesn't look like an American, so where is he from? But then they would say, and the word they would always use is Hindustan. They would say, he is from Hindustan. Hindustan was a term that the Turks gave to the region that we call South Asia. This region is one of the most culturally rich regions in the world. People talk about the Middle East as, as the Holy Land. The Middle East gave three religions to the world. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But there are only, what, 15 million Jews. India, too, has given three religions to the world, which is Buddhism and Hinduism and Sikhism. There are nearly 100 million Sikhs. And there are nearly 1.2 billion Hindus in the world. And now there are over 800 million Buddhists. So India is like, or Hindustan, the region is like the alternate Holy Land on this planet. So there is a lot of metaphysical, cultural depth in the region. Uh, I don't have much time, but I will recommend a movie to you all. It is called Had Anhat. H-A-D, U-N-H-A-D. Boundary and Boundless. That's the meaning of the word. Had and Anhat. It is a movie about a man called Kabir, who was, a, who was born a Muslim, but was raised by a Hindu family. And he used Islamic values and preach them in Hindu language. So like he will not say there is one Allah, he will say there is one Bhagavan. So it's a very interesting eclecticism. That movie traces the spirit of Kabir among fundamentalist Muslims in India and Pakistan and the Sufi Muslims in India and Pakistan and among the same fundamentalist Hindus and others and Kabir was also crucial to the Sikh faith. A lot of Kabir's poetry is incorporated into the scripture of the Sikhism. So in, in an in a interesting way, Kabir actually influenced three major faiths in the subcontinent. So India has a lot of metaphysical depth, which leads to some of the new challenges that the modern West is facing. We have a huge bifurcation of modernity and tradition in the West. Either you are completely an atheist, you are either a Bin Maher or you are a Jerry Falwell. You know, and, and those kind of stereotypes don't exist in this continent, which means I think that they are mystically better equipped to handle the challenges of postmodernity than in the West. And the same is true for the Chinese, given their, uh, their access, which they are now recovering to their Confucian tradition with the dilution of this atheism that came with communism. So the region has has assets which are not tangible, but which will give it uh, significant influence. For example, I was looking at, at religious conversion data. You can find this on Pew. 25% of Americans change their religion every year, or at least once in their lifetime. One fourth of Americans change their religion. The community which changes its religion the least in the US is the Hindu community which I found very fascinating. Primarily because there is very little conversion into Hinduism, so there is very little exit. Like for example, with Muslims, a lot of people converting to Islam and then a lot of people also leaving. Many of them would be Muslim for 10, 15 years and then leave and stuff like that. I don't know the data on Judaism, but I don't know whether you know that, but one third of all Buddhists in the US are Jews. Uh, so there is all these uh, are signs of existential anxiety with the inability to come to, to, to psychologically and uh, I dare say mystically come to terms with the conditions in which we live today with these tremendous challenges. Uh, and so in that sense, what I'm trying to say is that the region has civilizational strength. It has a civilizational strength 
which will give it much more stability as life becomes more and more competitive and more and more difficult on this planet. Things are changing very fast. I, I, I just recently discovered that we will have a food crisis in less than 20 years. A food crisis, the shortage of food in less than 20 years. Right now we produce surplus, we produce more food than we need. The problem of poverty and starvation is because of mismanagement or not distribution. It is not a production. But we will have a production problem. The only country which will not have a production problem is the US. So whether we have a global crisis of food, the only country which will be self-sufficient in food is the US. But guess what? All that food that we produce will be owned by China. Right now, the Chinese have nearly bought every storage facility of food in the US today. So there is all this, this whole vision of thinking forward, planning for the future. So there's, a, there's an element of cultural differences in which how these civilizations and these nations will compete. And that is why South Asia will become much, much more critical to the US in the near future. We can't afford to have empty seats like these for events like these. Uh, US interests in the region. The US interests in the region are very, very short-sighted. The US doesn't look far. One of the problems with, with US democracy is that it structurally inhibits long-term thinking. For example, we elect our congressman every two years, which means he's not thinking beyond two years. It's only the senators who have the privilege to think about long-term projects, long-term strategies. And these days, with, with uh, American elections, have become auctions. <coughs> this time, we probably will see a billion dollar presidency. You need a billion dollars, I think, this time, definitely, to, to win the White House. So people are so busy raising money. So if you're a congressman, if you're a senator, you're just raising money, 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 money all the time. You're constantly in campaign mode. So we're not thinking far. We're not thinking. So and that reflects even in our foreign policy, in our relation, which is short term. Our relation with Pakistan, which is now our biggest expense, we spend nearly $4 billion with gifts to Pakistan. That's different from all the money that we are spending, which is close to a billion dollars a week. Our Afghanistan bill is a billion dollars a week. That's what we are spending in Afghanistan. I don't know what we spent in, in the operations in Pakistan. That budget item line is not visible. So the US relationship is supposed to be strategic. We are strategic partners, our strategic allies in our battle against Al Qaeda, against our Taliban, against extremism in Pakistan, with the shared goal of making Pakistan a nuclear weapon safe and ensuring that there are no future attacks on the US soil coming from Pakistan. That is it. That is the extent of our interest in Pakistan right now. The relationship is very contentious. The US has killed as many Pakistanis in the last two years as extremists. So if you just look at the death toll, we are as good or as bad as Lashkar al Taiba or actually all the extremist groups in Pakistan combined. Because our share is 50% of the civilians that are killed in Pakistan are killed by us. So it's a hugely contentious because the Pakistani military is implicated in it, they are cooperating with us, the ground information and intelligence comes from the Pakistani government, they let us fly our planes and our drones, etc. There are no shared values. There is no discussion of shared values in Indo-Pakistan public domain. In fact, if you were watching the Pakistani public sphere as closely as I do, which means if you're reading their major newspapers, which are junk and dawn, at least once or twice a week, watching from the TV. I do more than 50 to 60 question answer sessions on BBC every year, which means I take one hour questions on US Pakistan relations. I did one this last week. And it's fascinating to me in the question that the extent of anti Americanism is unbelievable. It's never been this high in Pakistan. Uh, even among the so called secular elite, there is hostility towards Pakistan. They understand the need to have good relations with the US for financial reasons, for economic benefits, etc. The Pakistani economy is in trouble, it needs US guarantees, you can do loans from World Bank. I'm, they understand all this, and I'm talking with professors uh, from university. Usually, somebody from the university called Lums will be with me, the local guy. And, uh, and it is amazing that this, this whole relationship, we never talk about shared values between the US and Pakistan. We talk about shared interests, but not about shared values. In fact, 
these days, all the elite in Pakistan are making their political career by emphasizing that they have different values, that Islam is not like America, by showing that there is a civilization of clash. Uh, people keep thinking that Huntington was the first guy to write the clash of civilization. Actually, it was an Indian Muslim scholar called Moana Amiya Nadvi in 1950s wrote in Urdu a book titled Clash of Civilization between Islam and the West. He did not bother about it. Huntington had all this power and often was a Slavic civilization, the Russian. Moana Ali Nadvi's book is just straightforward, written in the 1950s about the forthcoming clash. So there is not much talk about shared values, which means that in moments of duress, what do we fall back on? If we say that we have common interests and when the hostility, the clash of interests becomes so severe that we have nothing non-interest related to fall back on. And that is the key question. We are at that moment in Pakistan where there is nothing fall back. We want them to do certain things and we are willing to pay for them. If they don't do it, then we don't know what, why Why else should we do this? And, uh, and, and the U.S. is not anymore like, you know, Colin Powell traveled in Pakistan. He told Musharraf, I'm giving you 48 hours. Either you cooperate with us or we will basically attack Pakistan and Afghanistan both. But now the U.S. is not in a position to make those kind of threats to anybody, really. I don't think they could even attack Delaware <coughs> without borrowing money from China or India. Uh, and the relationship is more of patron-client relationship. This is not conducive for long-term relationship. You can always fire your lawyer. It's that kind of a relationship if he's going to go. Whereas there has been a truly significant change in, in U.S. relations with India. And you can see that. For example, India and Pakistan have done the same thing that we accused Iran of trying to do, of getting nuclear weapons illegal. India and Pakistan's nuclear weapons in international law are illegal. So India didn't even sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They said, since we have not signed the treaty, or we are not obliged to do that. No, you don't have to be part of the treaty for it to become international law. Nobody has signed a treaty to so say that we will not shoot somebody who wears a white flag. You can't shoot anybody. It's called custom. customary law. It's much, much more powerful than laws based on treaties. Nevertheless, the U.S. has now a tremendous partnership with India, commercial, on nuclear development in India. So the U.S. is spending billions of dollars in commercial nuclear development in India, legitimizing and assisting and contributing to the development of India's nuclear program while it continues to prevent Iran and, of course, does not cooperate with Pakistan. So there are some of the issues. This is a new transition that is taking place. And, and there are discussions constantly of shared values. The oldest democracy and the biggest democracy. The US is the biggest, the oldest democracy in the world. India is the biggest democracy in the world. Both are secular democracies. So there are also this constant talk about shared values, which means that in moments of crisis, we have something to fall back that is shared values. Now this transition is going to affect this relationship. So it's like a, uh, one Indian reporter asked Clinton when he was visiting India, he said, we are tired of America double dating the region. It's time for you to stop being so promiscuous and it's time to get married. And India, and literally, that's what India's position is to the U.S. saying, look, You've been double dating for since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, our first boyfriend died or girlfriend. Yeah. Now you're the only one left. Either you get married, or we need to have a serious discussion about it. And th that discussion has not happened. And that's not a discussion that can happen between governments. That's a discussion that has to happen at many levels. It has to have happen at the public level. Uh, for example, recently the Chinese uh, premier made a comment saying that China. Pakistan is to China what Israel is to the United States. And I was asked to comment on it. Uh, well, they did tell me it was classified. Anyway, so I can share it. My, I, I just laughed at it when I was asked. To invite it. I said, how, how, how can that be? Look at the people-to-people -people relations that we have between Israel and the US. So we don't have that kind of people-to-people -people relations. Uh, Pakistan is not learning China. There are some Chinese who are learning a lot about Islam, but they are Muslim Chinese. They are coming and studying in Pakistan and learning Urdu and Arabic and Islamic faith, but they are Muslims from the Indian province. So, but nevertheless, 
India is also saying that the U.S. has two special relations. One is with Israel, and the other with the U.K., and it's time for the U.S. to get its third wife. And so this is a very serious discussion, which is probably, we are hoping that DLD will also be part of this discussion. And one of our goals is to make sure that when India and America negotiate this marriage, we will talk about what about Pakistan and that, so the hinge, the U.S. marriage with India will depend on what happens to the divorce between Pakistan and India. Will they sort of make up or not? Finally, the relationship is very different. Like the U.S., Pakistan is the biggest recipient of U.S. aid this year. India is the second biggest lender to the U.S. And uh, last time when we had this event, the Rotary Club, I made a comment which upset Pakistanis a lot, and I'm going to repeat it, because it's a fact. The fact is that what has happened to the U.S. now is that when we go out and have lunch with Pakistan, we have to pick up the tab every time. But when you go and have lunch with India, you can rest assured that half the time, or most of the time, they are willing to pick up the tab. For example, we are giving Pakistan one, four billion dollars for our interest in Afghanistan, whereas India is spending more than a billion dollars in Afghanistan, clearly showing that there are much more closer common interests between the U.S. and India, because India is actually putting its money where its mouth is. And if we have common interests with Pakistan, it's like saying, if you say, I also want to go to New York, and I say, I also want to go to New York, then why do I have to pay every time? What would you do if I didn't give you a list? Wouldn't you take the bus or the train? So just put in some gas money, buddy. So that is the whole issue, and it is beginning to tell. I don't think that the U.S. economy is going to recover. We're not going to be as rich as we were in 2000 in the next 15, 20 years. It is quite possible that the structural adjustments that have taken place in the U.S. economy are permanent. Like, for example, Great Britain is not going to be a global power like it was in the 19th century in the foreseeable future. We can say that for sure. It's not going to happen in the next 50 years. And the same kind of situation we are reaching, the U.S. infrastructure is based on the 1950s. So we're not going to go back to the period where in 1999 we were completely dominant economically and militarily. And the less economically influential we are, the less possibility for us to make peaceful impact on global politics. We can't just buy people's uh, interests and change. And so, and because we're indebted to the region, we can't even use force. And the war in Iraq actually proves to Americans, and I hope to learn the lesson, that military force does not guarantee political outcomes that we desire anymore. Those days are gone. Finally, there is a strategic global vision, and that strategic global vision is, like I said before, what happens with China? Will China be an American partner, and will we both run the world for the next 100 years? Or will we be forced to compete with China? Before the 9-11 thing happened, I actually attended many seminars where we were seriously discussing in Washington whether we should attack China now and bomb it back into the 60s, then wait for it to be powerful enough where we cannot attack it anymore. That was a decision for us to make in the 1990s, whether we should impede China's growth, both economically and militarily. After 20 years, I don't think we can compete with China, either economically or militarily. And in, when China's per capita income reaches six or $7,000, it will be a bigger economy in absolute numbers than the U.S., which means that it can spend more dollars in absolute terms than the U.S. on defense and military budget. And given the fact that it gets more for its dollar, China could actually spend twice on defense than the U.S. in less than five years from now. So that's where India becomes very critical. So the U.S. is now thinking of an India-U.S. alliance against China, which would make the region very difficult, because then it would be China and Pakistan versus India and U.S., and that would be formed into a powers. This region is a very, very complicated region. It has 25% of the world's poorest people who live in South Asia. The fastest economies in the region, are, in the world, are now in South Asia. And nearly 40% of the world's nuclear weapons countries are in the region. 
So it is very important for Americans to start thinking very seriously about these countries as to what happens there matters to us. We cannot just have this transactional relationship with Pakistan as they're saying, okay, as long as you help us do these three or four things, we'll give you this money and it's over. No. It's an unstable Pakistan is a danger to India, is a danger to the US. Uh, three years ago, I, I did a big seminar like this in the in Institute for Defense Studies in India, and my suggestion was that India should actually adopt Pakistan rather than fighting with Pakistan. And unstable Pakistan is the biggest threat is to India, because in India's interest to stabilize Pakistan, even fight the poverty in Pakistan, a prosperous, stable Pakistan is an Indian interest. And it was very interesting to see to me that not everybody was horrified by what I was saying, <laughs> okay, especially at the minister level, they understood these things and they said, yes, you're right about other you would have already had a war with Pakistan. So these are very serious issues that our children are in the midst of. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that it's time for us to have much more serious consequence. There's one very serious consequence if you ignore India particularly, and I'm going to show that and then I'll stop and take your questions. I want to talk about Iqbal. I promised Ike that I would talk about Iqbal, so let me take two or three minutes to talk about Iqbal. Iqbal is a very interesting person. He was the one who came up with this idea of a separate homeland for Muslims. And he, this is how he phrased it. I therefore demand the formation of a consolidated Muslim state in the best interest of India and Islam. It was in some mid-1930s that he came up with this idea. But what is interesting is that he came up with this uh, if someone wants to know what the share is, I will talk to you about it in the question and answer. But he wrote this song, which is very, very popular about India. It's a Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamar. More beautiful than any place on earth is this India of ours, this Hindustan of ours. At that time, Hindustan meant Pakistan and Bangladesh as part of it, the South Asia region. And then he said, Burukbat mein ho agar hum rehta hai dil watan mein. Even when we are living abroad, in strange places, our heart <coughs> is in India. And Samjo, wahi hame bhi bhi ho jaha hama. So understand that I am there where my heart really is. And then this was the most key thing. He said, Mazhab nahi sikata, apas ne bayar. Religion does not teach interfaith conflict. This was his point. Interfaith conflict is not taught by religion. Hindi hai hum, vatan hai Hindustan. We are Indians and our religion is. Our country is India, or we are Hindustani, and our land is Hindustan. And uh, several years later, this man went into space. This man's name is Rakesh Sharma. In 1984, he saw India from space, and Indra Gandhi, India's Prime Minister then, asked him and said, how does India look from space? When you look at India from space, how does it look? And this is what he said. That was the words of Iqbal, no Indian had ever said it. But like I said, there's something that I want to show you, the future probably of the US, which is very, very interesting. I don't know how to get to this and so go here. Quick time.
YouTube, and uh, she contacted a couple, of them. and there was no South Asian in that place. She got her whole family to practice for three weeks to this song, and the dance is on her wedding. This is their wedding that they had this song. This was in America. Yes, yeah. right. But what was interesting about this woman was she asked me, "Why did you pick this song? Is it because the rules were easy?" And she said, no, because this song to me symbolizes salvation. Salam in the Muslim. Salam is what how Muslims address each other. It's a peace on you. And the Muslim is how Hindus greet each other. So that is interesting. It is it's become very common now that America is now beginning to dance with their music. It's already in England is very common these dances. England's national food is the curry. I don't know whether you know it, right? Yeah. The curry is the national food. Can I get the light up? I'm done with this. I'll be happy to answer questions. And um, you have any? I know I see a lot of stuff. Please make sure we get I do have one question. Go ahead. I'm, I'm intrigued by your remark that. Uh, How they can make peace, or, or no, I'm sorry, this is the second question, the first one. That in Kashmir, if the India is the, one of the second biggest or the biggest democracy in the world, then why can't they have the will of the people of the area to vote for what they want to do? They want to have their own state, they want to join Pakistan, they want to join India. Why don't they do that? This is the common argument that Pakistanis make. No, no, but it is a, it, no, it's not a Pakistan. It is a common sense argument. It's, it's yeah, yeah. Sure. Democracy is democracy. Right. So what happens is that in 1947, when India and Pakistan were created, Kashmir was an independent state. It was not part of India. It was not part of Pakistan. So several tribal leaders in Pakistan attacked Kashmir in 1947. And later they were held by the Pakistani army. Let me get the map up to show you what happened. Oh, okay. So I thought I had, I would get it out of the way early, but okay, so can you see the map? Yeah. So if you look at the map, this this green part, the this yellow thing was the entire Kashmir state as designed by the British, it's called the Johnson Line. The British design became independent. So 47 Pakistani tribal and the army moved in. The, no, Kashmir was an interesting state. It was like Hyderabad, but out of Kashmir was nearly 85 to 90 percent Muslim, but ruled by a Hindu king. And Hyderabad was 80 percent Hindu, ruled by a Muslim king. And these two provinces were separate entities. So the king wanted help from India. And the Indians said, we will not intervene unless you become part of India. So the king of Kashmir signed what is called an accession, accession, well, I can't say that, accession document, by which the state of Kashmir became part of India. So then, by at least two or three months later, the Indian army came in, and they were able to retain what you see as a red part. So basically what happened, technically, is after 47, the Pakistanis moved in and took this much of the Kashmir state, and the Indians moved in and took it. And then it went to the Security Council, and the Resolution 42 was passed. Resolution 42 says that they must conduct a plebiscite here and ask the people, because one king, one man basically said, I want to be with India because he was ticked off with Pakistan. So that, that, that's not really a very valid way. And India agreed at the Security Council. It's called 42 is it's available on the web. Just Google UN Security Council Resolution 42. Now, what the resolution requires is to have a plebiscite in this whole area, not just here. Pakistan will not allow plebiscite in Azad Kashmir. Pakistan wants plebiscite only here. Pakistan says we will ask only these Kashmiris, and only two options. They want only one question with two options. Will you like to join India or would you like to join Pakistan? There's no third option. No third option. The Kashmiris want three options. Yeah. The Kashmiris want the option, can we join India? Can we, do you want to join India? Do you want to join Pakistan? Or do you want to be an independent state? 
both India and Pakistan don't want the third option on the plebiscite. But India has a very simple point. It says Pakistan should withdraw to this border. We will withdraw to this border. Then let's have a plebiscite in this whole area. That is the standard position that India has taken since 1956. So that is out of the question. Neither of the two are going to withdraw its troops. Who is going to withdraw why, its troops? Why does not Pakistan agree to that? Because they are not sure about their own citizens. These Kashmiris will all get together and want an independent state. Why not? That's fine. But Pakistan doesn't want an independent state. Neither does India want an independent state. There are three different options. Like in the Kashmir groups that there are, there are three groups actually in India formally. Those who are with India, those who are with Pakistan, those who are independent. So the plebiscite option is now dead. So the only option that is really left is line of actual control. You keep what you have, we will keep our people have changed so much. Even culturally, there are huge differences now. So much so that I have sat on discussion between Kashmiris who have come to the US from here and Kashmiris who have come to the US from here. There is a huge difference. For example, there are 2 million Muslims in UK. 66% of them are from Pakistan. So two thirds of all Muslims in Britain are from Pakistan. And of those, 80% are from a village called Mirpur here. So nearly 1.2 million Pakistanis out of what would be the two third, 1.8 million Pakistanis in Britain. 1.2 or 1.3 are Kashmiris from one village, Mirpur. If you go to Mirpur, uh, the exchange, <laughs> you can do business with pounds in Mirpur. You don't need Pakistani rupee at all. Everybody has at least one person living in England, and then there are marriages going on. Every time I used to fly through Frankfurt, uh, one of the things that I do if my flight is late and I have is escort Pakistani women, young women who have married people in Britain and they are going to Britain and they don't know how to find their next flight. <laughs> I did this twice. It was very interesting. Once in Amsterdam, once in Frankfurt, at least six, seven. And to me, it's very interesting because uh, I can understand Punjabi. And Pakistanis speak Punjabi like Hindi with, with, with an accent, so I can even talk to them. So it, it gives me a very interesting uh, uh, insight into the region. So this is where we are. Now the problem is that the Hindu movement in India, the Hindu nationalists, have made a big issue out of Kashmir. And in Pakistan, everybody has made it. In Pakistan, you can run against Islam and win an election. Like PPP, the secular party. The PPP continues to win elections in Pakistan. But in Pakistan, you cannot say, I'm going to settle for Kashmir with this line of control and ever win an election. Kashmir is more important to Pakistan than Islam itself. You know, what is interesting is the whole idea of creating Pakistan was to say that religion mattered more than anything else. Indians and Pakistanis have so much in common, it's unbelievable. You know, if you have a fight between Indians and Pakistanis, run an Indian music song and both will start dancing. Even if they don't like it, their whole body will shake and they will be fine. It will be funny, right? So the, it is part of their system. But they said, oh, we can't live together as religious communities. And so Pakistan and India were divided. That thing didn't even last 25 years. When Bangladesh emerged, what Bangladesh tells me, at least as a social scientist, is that ethnicity is more important than religion. Because Islam couldn't keep the two Pakistans together. Ethnicity spread them up. So this whole idea that Islam would keep us together and religion. But I don't think, I don't think the fault of Islam is to do with the I'm politics. not saying Islam is not an agent. Yeah, Islam is what Muslims yeah. say Islam is. In Saudi Arabia, Islam is women yeah, can't ride. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that the same politicians, they're all, most of them are still alive, right? They couldn't live together. And ethnicity proved to be stronger. So these Kashmiri politicians are heavily invested in it. Uh, I think it's much more easier to convince India to accept the line of control than at the moment it is in Pakistan. Because there are lots of civil society. Pakistan has a whole bunch of violent members of the civil society who have emerged for the sole purpose of liberating Kashmir. And it will be impossible to make peace for any politician in the near future. It has to be in the next generation. Or there has to be a massive war which will settle it. There are the only two other ways. Either you re-educate the population or you have to accept defeat with a war. 
And that is the only solution. India can't fight Pakistan now because they are both nuclear powers. And so there is no, India can't afford to win a conventional war. If they win a conventional war, then nukes will come into play. So what's the point of fighting a war? So India can't win a war no matter how powerful it becomes. It's right neighbor, you know, if they sleep one bomb in, you can have huge casualties. So that is the issue. So there has to be, that's why groups like this, DLD, become important. We can conduct dialogues here, which cannot take place there. But it also depends on the credibility of the diaspora back home. We are credible there as long as we are giving them things. Once we start telling them what to do, they'll kick us out, <laughs> they'll take away the poi. People of Indian origin cars, I bet you they'll get cancelled if you start telling India what its foreign policy should be like. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. I have, I grew up in Chandigarh, uh, which is close to uh, Somewhere here? Right. So I have been to Kashmir about, I don't know, 10 or 12 times, and I, the interesting piece is that we have been, Indians and the Pakistanis are so sentimental and emotional about Kashmir, but nobody really talks about the Kashmiris. If you talk, I have friends from Kashmir, they really don't, they are so fed up. I mean, if you go to Kashmir now, as opposed to what it was about 20 years back, they are they're destroyed. People don't have jobs, people are so poor, they don't want to be with Pakistan or with India maybe. Right? But we forget that. We just want to, I think it's a, it's an ego thing. Half of the people who fight about Kashmir from India or Pakistan have not visited Kashmir, but they are so sentimental about it, they're so emotional about it. I, you know. It is a very strange thing. You know, really, very crudely, they're not interested in the people. Of no, the they're not. They're interested in the land more than the people. Well, it's, an ego it's, thing. It's, about, it's almost like, like for example, if you tell India, do you want this region? They'll say no. But what if you take all these people out? They'll say yes. So it's about land. It's not about people. Like Kashmir. I mean, it's nearly. I went there in 1986 when the insurgency started, and and uh, there was strange laws. Like for example, I saw apples lying all over on the ground. 